Arthritis Unpacked is an independent patient education resource supported by Janssen. The information provided is for educational purposes and does not replace advice from your healthcare professional. Paul Bird is an experienced rheumatologist and researcher dedicated to the expert management of patients with all forms of arthritis and rheumatic disease. As well as caring for patients in his clinical practice, he continues to undertake arthritis research with fellow Australian rheumatologists and with international colleagues, ensuring he is up to date with the most recent medical advances. Welcome to the second episode of Arthritis Unpacked a video series designed to help you understand your arthritis better and help you get the best out of your treatment. Join me, Dr Paul Bird, an arthritis specialist, which is also known as a rheumatologist, as together we unpack your arthritis baggage, helping you navigate the maze of arthritis terms and treatments. Arthritis without the jargon, arthritis made simple, arthritis unpacked. Today we're going to talk about rheumatoid arthritis, the basics. On a rainy September afternoon, I stepped out into my waiting room and called Kylie's name. No one answered or looked up. So I walked out into the waiting room and called the name again. It was a busy day with three or four doctors working, lots of patients in the waiting room, so voices sometimes get lost in the crowd. So I tried again, this time a little louder. I saw a hand go up in the corner. There a man struggled to help his wife from her seat. I walked towards him to help, but he waved me away kindly. Okay, it's okay, I've got it. So I waited until they were nearly with me and we walked back together into my room. He helped her into her seat and made sure she was comfortable and sat in his own chair, his hands ringing. His concern for his wife was obvious on his face. I waited a moment and then began. Welcome, my name's Paul Bird. I'm a rheumatologist, a specialist in arthritis. Your GP sent you here because he thinks that I can help you with your arthritis. So can you help me by telling me about your symptoms? While waiting for her to begin, I looked at her hands. The joints were swollen. She was wearing slip-ons, her feet too painful to fit into her usual shoes, and she was in a lot of pain. She was crumpled in the chair, her body battered by the arthritis that had taken hold of it. Hi, I'm Kylie, she said. Is it okay if my husband Carl fills you in? My memory for the details is not too good. No problem, I said, that's absolutely okay. Just take me through it in your own time. Carl relayed a familiar story. His 32-year-old wife had been always well, healthy, and energetic. Then, six weeks after the birth of their first child, a baby daughter, she began to become unwell. At first she told him that her joints were stiff and she had trouble grasping things, dropping them unexpectedly. Then she was finding it really hard to get out of bed at night to get up to the baby. Knees and feet were hurting so much. Within a week, she could barely get out of bed, fingers and hands swollen, and she had the most profound fatigue. She was getting worse. None of the painkillers were working. As he spoke, I watched him hand her a tissue as she tried to hide her tears. I'm sorry, he said, it's just that she gets so upset when I talk about it. It's a story I'd heard too often, listening to how someone's life had been changed so much by something they didn't have a name for, something that made no sense, had no reason, and unable to fight back, unable to resist, they were falling away. Kylie's story is a typical story for inflammatory arthritis. In episode one, we talked about the lining of the joint. The synovium becomes swollen and thickened, produces too much fluid, usually lots of joints at the same time. And her type was an autoimmune type, the type where her body gets a mismessage from within and starts to attack her own joints. Kylie had rheumatoid arthritis. We rheumatologists call it very active, meaning terribly inflamed and making the patient really sick. She was in the midst of it all right, in the middle of the storm and struggling to get out. Rheumatoid arthritis is a term that a lot of people recognise, but not many people know what it means. Rheumatoid arthritis refers to a type of arthritis that fits within the inflammatory category. You remember before we talked about inflammatory arthritis is where the synovium is inflamed and produces lots of fluid leading to joint swelling. Rheumatoid is a disease that is systemic, 
And what I mean by that is the immune system is attacking the person. It makes them exhausted. They lose their appetite. They have what we call systemic or system-wide symptoms. Symptoms are not just in the joints, but they feel sick, really sick. In this episode, we begin to unpack rheumatoid arthritis, how it presents, how to navigate your way through to the best treatment, and in other episodes, what's the most effective diet and exercise. It's a big part of the suitcase and will help you understand a lot of types of arthritis. So let's start unpacking. Rheumatoid arthritis is a unique form of inflammatory arthritis. And here's an interesting piece of history. RA has been in the world a long time, but the first formal evidence of RA appears in 1591. French physician applies the term rheumatism to a condition characterized by swelling, stiffness, and pain. He hypothesized that there was an increase in the number of people developing this condition associated with a post-Columbian Europe. In 1852, Sir Alfred Garrod renamed the condition rheumatoid arthritis and defined it as a separate condition to osteoarthritis. Previously, the two disorders were considered a singular disease, arthritis deformans. No wonder everyone was confused. There's a lot of theories about why RA increases in the 1500s, but no one really knows for sure why. But since it appeared, the numbers have been steady. By that I mean one in a hundred people in every country in the world is affected by rheumatoid arthritis. That's remained stable over hundreds of years. I've told you some of the theories about the history of rheumatoid arthritis. Let me tell you some of the theories about how and why it starts. Our understanding from research is that something gets into our system and in some people, after dealing with the foreign invader, the immune system can't turn off and it keeps running around as if the body is under attack. Whether it's a virus or bacteria or something else that sets off the process, no one knows. Yet, researchers are working on this as we speak, but there's a way to go. But it goes something like this. When we get an infection, this triggers a response and the immune system, our protector, ramps up. The person may not even be that sick, but they usually recover completely. And for most individuals, well, that's it. The immune system's job is finished, job done. It goes and sits on the reserve bench, waiting to be called back onto the field if needed. But for some people, and we don't know why, their immune system doesn't take a back seat. In fact, having played a pretty good game, it decides the game is still on and it decides to play every position on the field. That's the start of rheumatoid arthritis and the joint synovium is the target. The immune system is everywhere, inflaming the joints, causing the person to feel sick and tired because it's going hammer and tongs 24 seven. So why do some people get it and some people don't? Once again, I have to use that phrase, no one knows yet. We have some clues, but right now, we can't be sure why one person gets RA and another doesn't. Let's unpack some of the clues anyway. Genetics may be part of it, but unfortunately it's not like inheriting brown eyes or red hair. Genetics is unfortunately not that simple, and although scientists have been able to map the whole human genome, the mystery of what genes are important in RA is still at large. There are people working on understanding this better right as we speak, and as you listen to this, they're trying to find the connection so that we can work out who could be susceptible. So we can prevent this from happening altogether. But at the present time, we just don't know for sure. What we've been able to figure out, however, is that females are more likely to get RA, but again, it's for reasons that we don't fully understand yet. Smoking is a trigger. People who smoke are more likely to get RA because the smoke converts a chemical in the lungs that can trigger RA. But did you or a relative eat something wrong to get RA? Or did you do something wrong? Nope, not as far as we know. I'm afraid to say that that's the best leads we have so far. Like I said, research continues to find the cause and lots of different leads are being followed. Let's focus on what happens once someone develops RA and importantly, how we stop it. Now, once the whole game kicks off, it's really busy 
because as I said, the immune system has got a party going on on its own and the normal controls, the normal coaxing from the immune system to bring it back under control, well, it's just not listening anymore. What does all this misguided activity lead to? What happens to the person? At times, it's not pretty, but let's look at the symptoms. RA is one of the inflammatory types of arthritis. We already talked about how these conditions affect the synovium, the tissue paper lining of the joints that produces lubricating fluid. So one of the first signs is the joints beginning to swell, and this swelling causes pain as the tissues and nerves around the joint stretch and groan. Hands, wrists, feet, knees and shoulders, virtually any joint can be involved. The onset can be sudden or occur over several weeks. What most patients report to me is they noted stiffness in their joints in the morning or after sitting still for a period of time. They feel exhausted, have poor appetite and may feel like they have a low grade fever. And unlike osteoarthritis, the wear and tear arthritis, RA usually affects lots of joints all at once. At this point the person is wondering what is wrong with them. They'll be in their 20s, 30s or 40s and think, I'm too young to have arthritis. Generally, they've taken some painkillers or anti-inflammatories and sensibly hang in there, hoping it'll go away. But when the symptoms don't go away, they see their primary care practitioner. I'll talk more about the therapy in a later podcast, but for now, although painkillers relieve the symptoms for most people, they are not gonna help fix the problem. What happens then, hopefully, is that the person seeing their primary care practitioner or health professional will be recognised as having rheumatoid arthritis. That's commonly referred to as a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Blood tests will usually be ordered and images or x-rays are taken and then the person is referred to a specialist, someone like me, a rheumatologist to help manage the problem. The ideal situation is as fast as possible, from symptom onset to when they come to see me or a specialist like me. And believe me, I wish that everyone had that path. But listening to this, your path may have been very different. You may have spent your time going from professional to professional, trying to find an answer for your symptoms. Then you might have suffered for a long time before you got an answer. Sadly, that is the path for many people with rheumatoid arthritis. But thankfully, with better education of patients and doctors, that long and winding road is becoming less common. What I'm describing is the ideal road, the road where someone has symptoms, they're recognised early, and they get to a rheumatologist quickly for treatment. I really wish that was the path for everyone. But regardless of the road that you took to get to the rheumatologist, you'll be familiar with what happens when you get there. First, the rheumatologist will listen to your story. Well, they should listen. That's the best way to get the information. Then they might ask you a few simple questions. Every person I meet with rheumatoid arthritis has their own story, their own experience. As a rheumatologist, part of that experience is being able to recognise all of the different stories, all of the different experiences being symptoms of the same disorder, and to make an accurate diagnosis. The next part of the process is to examine your joints, gently checking the ones that are swollen and seeing which ones are tender, working how much the RA is affecting you at that time. Perhaps, and this varies from rheumatologist to rheumatologist, checking your grip strength and how much your joints can move. For me, these indicators also give me a good benchmark as we proceed with therapy to see how much you're improving as we go along. I'll probably listen to your heart and lungs as well to make sure they're okay. We do that just to make sure there's no other background problems that haven't been picked up by other doctors. It's one of those things we're taught to do as physicians and it serves us well. Sometimes we pick up other incidental things that need fixing and we can make sure that we do that as part of your treatment. Once we finish the examination, I'll look at your blood tests. Most patients will come to me with tests which have been done by their primary care physician, but sometimes they don't come with any and I'll order or prescribe those on the spot. But let's assume that you've come with blood test results and we can look at those together at the visit. So that's a quick tour of the causes and the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, as well as what might happen when you first visit a rheumatologist. 
We will return to Kylie's story later on in subsequent videos so that you can see how she does over time. The next thing that happens is your rheumatologist looks at the tests that are available and will probably order some new ones. These might include blood tests, x-rays or an ultrasound of your joints. And we'll talk about these in the next video. I'm Professor Paul Bird and this is a video series all about arthritis. Without the jargon, arthritis made simple. Arthritis Unpacked.